the editor of choice. Mile after mile of footage was shaped by his hand and his telling eye. But he knew the director called the shots, and he was ready for a career behind the camera. There was no story or genre or style he wouldn't try. Some films he took for love, others for a chance to keep on at his craft. Through them all, there was humanity and delicacy and themes he hoped would speak through all his movies. The horrors of war and hate, the call to peace, and a plea for the best within us, even and most especially in the darkest of times. For over 60 years, he has carried on a soft-spoken and unbroken romance with the art and craft of movie making. Of this modest man from the American Plains, it has been written, he is one of a group of men working in Hollywood who has never lost nor concealed the purity of his hopes and intentions. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Fonda. When I was filming two people with Bob Wise, we were locked on the Marrakesh Express for a couple of weeks, shooting at Marrakesh, of course. I spent uh, a good time uh, liberating pieces of the Marrakesh Express to give to my friend Graham Nash, who had written the song. Marrakesh Express. And of course, uh, we were all misbehaving on the set. Estelle Parsons was the, the best, the misbehaving part. And Bob constantly had to walk through a barrage of water balloons and firecrackers. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> then one day he decided to put a stop to it, which is, of course, exactly what should have happened. He walked down the train to talk to us. And um, Lindsay Wagner and I and Estelle were sitting in a little compartment, in, which was called the makeup room on a train. And he came down and said uh, something about we had to stop doing this. And one of the makeup assistants ran past and threw him what seemed to be the largest firecracker I'd ever seen. It was about this big, about that big round. It was the core from a toilet paper roll. And it was filled with face powder. And he put a firecracker inside it. Kind of reminded me of my father and Ensign Pulver and Mr. Roberts. This thing came lobbying through, and Bob was kindly telling us we shouldn't be doing this. And kaboom! And all this powder settled down. We looked like characters in the Looney Tune cartoons, I swear to God. <laughs> you know, Bob just kind of brushed it off and asked us very quietly to please stop throwing firecrackers. <laughs> I mean, he said it so politely. It was almost sweet. It was just fantastic. And so, of course, we stopped playing with firecrackers. Long before I ever worked with Bob, before I ever even knew his name, I was entranced by his films. I remember sitting as in a theater as a kid, watching this incredible sci-fi film, the horror, the suspense, this thing called The Body Snatchers. Sooner than before, to stroke a luck, you might say. Good. Well, that's the street singer. I know her, I tell you. She was alive and hearty only this evening. It's impossible she can be dead. You could not have gotten this body fairly. You're entirely mistaken. You'd better give me my money and make the proper entry. Good night, Dr. Bailey. Thank you. 
are you doing, Danny? Sounds like you're tearing the roof apart. The rocket you're making is... Now oh, I know why people scream because I think I'm going to. Is the door locked? Long before 2001, the movie or the year, Robert Wise made a film about extraterrestrial contact with Earth that has been called an acknowledged masterpiece, irresistible to audiences, and admired universally by filmmakers. From beginning to end, it took only six weeks to shoot. Bob's flying saucer cost a grand total of $100,000, and with that, he became the pioneer of films that have now brought countless aliens to Earth and taken us on stunning voyages to galaxies far, far away. It was 1951. It was the day the Earth stood still and the movies changed. The test of any such higher authority is, of course, the police force that supports it. For our policemen, we created a race of robots. Their function is to patrol the planets in spaceships like this one and preserve the peace. In matters of aggression, we have given them absolute power over us. This power cannot be revoked. At the first sign of violence, they act automatically against the aggressor. The penalty for provoking their action is too terrible to risk. The result is we live in peace, without arms or armies, secure in the knowledge that we are free from aggression and war, free to pursue more profitable enterprises. Now, we do not pretend to have achieved perfection, but we do have a system, and it works. I came here to give you these facts. There is no concern of ours how you run your own planet. But if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder. Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace or pursue your present course and face obliteration. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you.
Many of Bob's friends and colleagues are here tonight to salute him. Here is a wonderful actress who worked with Bob in Something for the Birds, Three Secrets, and The Day the Earth Stood Still. Ladies and gentlemen, Patricia Neal. I am very proud of those three films I made with you, Bob. In one of them, you created the only untarnished being left in Hollywood, my faithful Gort. In another, you managed to keep not one or two, but three secrets. Mr. Kenneth Starr might take note of this. It gives one food for thought when the only real secret we have left is Victoria's secret. And that ain't much. <laughs> Thank you, Bob the day my earth stood still and my world turned and I had the great pleasure of working with you until we meet again. He starred in Bob's 1979 motion picture, Star Trek, which led to co-writing and directing two, producing one, and starring in the first six Star Trek movies, Leonard Nimoy. When, when Paramount set out to make the first Star Trek movie, they reached out for Bob Wise to direct. And when Bob came on board, he discovered that Paramount had, been success had successfully rounded up all of the original Star Trek cast except me. Seems that I had a little difficulty with the studio at the time that had to be ironed out. And Bob, in his very gentlemanly way, laid down a very quiet ultimatum to the studio. He said something like, to make Star Trek the motion picture without Mr. Spock, not wise. <laughs> so uh, as a result of that stand that he took, I was given this great opportunity to work and, and, and enjoy the work in several Star Trek movies, but particularly the great opportunity to work with an artist, uh, a wonderful craftsman, and an incredible gentleman. Live long and prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, Rita Moret. I couldn't resist. Tonight, uh, the film industry gathers together to honor a marvelously talented individual, and I want to add my own special thanks. Thank you, Bob, for helping me to win that Oscar. One of my favorite moments in the movie is the, what we called the Tonight Quintet, when you see all of the gangs preparing for the rumble, the collage of weapons culminating in that fierce orange light of the sun as the rumble approaches. It still takes my breath away, knocks me out. And nearly 40 years later, West Side Story is still the measure by which all other musicals are judged. Coming out on top tonight. We're gonna watch for another drop tonight. That's what a rig and tumble go down. And when he's southern uncle, we'll tear up the town. We'll be in back at you, boy. Right. You're gonna flatten him good. Right. right. And we'll be gone. We're gonna 
Ladies and gentlemen, Candice Burke. I had the good fortune of starring in Robert Wise's film, The Sand Pebbles. It was my second film. And I had started The Sand Pebbles, and when I finished, I was 36. <laughs> We were on location in Taiwan, um, which was then Formosa. It was a time when mainland China dropped propaganda leaflets every night, and Steve McQueen was staging his own revolution on the set and on the entire Pacific Rim. There was no plumbing in downtown Taipei, and the hottest night spot was not open to any women but the performers, who I am told had a unique way of peeling and consuming a banana. <laughs> Amidst all this chaos stood a pillar of stability, Bob Wise. He filmed The Sand Pebbles in 1966. The story was set in the China of the 1920s and told of an American gunboat, the USS San Pablo, wandering aimlessly up and down the Yangtze River looking for direction. The boat was Bob's metaphor for an America in 1966 that was another trip into Asia. So I've come from eternity to here. Bob Wise's Night of Honor. Bob, I was proud to be a part of it. Thank you and Sai Chin. What happens if you make it? You get a wish. Oh. Jake, you made it. You got it. You get a wish. What do you want? I don't know. <laughs> well, there must be something. Yeah, well, I used to want a... want an engine. Isn't the engine still important? Well, not like it used to be. Why don't you take my wish? Okay. Oh, hey, uh, Mr. Jameson said I could lend these to you. These are the booklets for the machinery. Okay, I'll look them over. All right. Well, go ahead, take your wish. Okay. Jake? Huh? Don't you want to know? Know what? Don't you want to know what I wish for? Okay. Well, I wish that someday you'd feel like telling me more about yourself. Sometime. When you feel like it. Okay. He worked with Bob in the Hindenburg, Charles Durning. So now I've been sitting over here all night listening to everybody say how Bob never loses his temper. <laughs> well, I got the skinny on that. <laughs> now, we were uh, all ready to blow up the uh, Hindenburg. The scene was ready, the actors were ready, the cameras were ready, but not in place. And um, he was explaining to the stuntman uh, how uh, the signal for him to go on and set the fire. He said, when I bring my arm up like this and bring it down, that's the signal. So now, the special effects people knew, knew the signal, but the assistant director didn't. So he's asking Bob, what is the signal? <laughs> right, and Bob says, when I go like this, then go like that. And on cue, 
the special effects guys sets fire to the, <laughs> to the Hindenburg, and this roar and this boom goes up. And Bob whips off his hat, slams it into the ground, and stamps on it about two or three times. And then stood there with his arms folded and watched this beautiful scene go up in smoke. And now his secretary comes over and says to him, Mr. Wise, would, would you like lunch? <laughs> and he said, yes, I would. And she said, what would you like to have? And he said, arsenic on toast. <laughs> well, that loss of temper was uh, to Bob Wise like a nuclear meltdown. But nobody lost their jobs, and everybody worked in this town again. And we all walked off with a brand new best friend and a perfect example of a pure gentleman, a kind, gentle gentleman. Mr. Wise, I salute you. Now a beloved actor who starred in I Want to Live, Theodore Bickell. Bob directed this film with a light hand, a delicate hand, and a, and a meticulous attention to detail. So much so that when we shot the scenes in the gas chamber, they were so real and so authentic that none of us, including the last stagehand, couldn't wait to get out of that set. It was uh, incredible. Now, if Bob had a message to deliver with that film, he also had a wonderful story and a gripping film, and that was all to his credit. Now, we have a message tonight, too, in honoring his life and his career, and the message is that we delight when good guys and decent guys finish first. Thank you, Bob. I had the joy of sharing The Sound of Music with Christopher Plummer. Chris is performing on stage in Toronto, but he has sent us a verse that he composed. And it reads, I swear there can never be adequate praise for this gentle master of all he surveys, a man who's been a legend most of his days. His list of accomplishments could reach the skies, and you can tell right away when you look in his eyes that wise is wisdom, and wisdom is wise. So now let us look at the wise film that did touch the skies and fill screens and hearts all over the world.
now to present the Life Achievement Award. It is my honor to introduce its 1988 recipient, my dear friend, Jack Lemon. You know, in the old days, there used to be a sign on the Warner Brothers studios that said, combining good citizenship with good picture making. The sign should have been on Bob's house. Robert Wise has directed and produced 39 motion pictures with intelligence and Lord knows artistry, earning four Academy Awards, and he still found time to provide conscientious leadership to the Directors Guild of America, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the American Film Institute. The Life Achievement Award is presented each year to an individual selected by the trustees who has advanced the art of film in the United States and whose work has stood the test of time. Over the past 65 years, Bob Wise has created an enduring body of work and he has made films that, as he put it, are personal to me, that express matters I feel strongly about, social justice and the need for honesty, integrity, and generosity of spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Wise. Thank you so very much. I'm very grateful to the American Film Institute for this wonderful honor. I've heard that uh, some people who have been saved from drowning in the nick of time report a remarkable experience. They say that they saw their lives flash before them just like, like watching scenes from a movie. Well, I feel very lucky tonight. I saw hundreds of scenes that recall some of my happiest moments and the happiest moments of my life, and I'm still dry. First of all, 
First of all, I must thank some absent friends and co-workers who are no longer with us. Working with each of them was a memorable experience. They brought so much to our collaboration that I couldn't accept your generous tribute tonight without mentioning Val Luton, Orson Welles, James Cagney, Robert Ryan, Clark Gable, Susan Hayward, Natalie Wood, Burt Lancaster, Bob Mitchum, Steve McQueen, and my special associate, Saul Chaplin. I don't think any director was ever more fortunate than the great array of talents who shared the effort and enriched the work. I also want to single out my wife, Millicent, a loving companion, an inspiration, and a devoted supporter in every part of my life. And I'm so happy and proud that our daughter, Pamela, and our granddaughter, Alexandra, are here to share this evening, too. Little did I think as a young boy 75 years ago that the trips to the three movie houses in Connersville, Indiana would have brought me to this stage tonight. I used to sit transfixed in the dark watching those silent yet eloquent shadows. I never guessed that I would have the power to influence others as those images influenced me. The movies have been my life's work, the only vocation I've ever known. For, like many of you here tonight, I fell under the spell of the movies. To tell the truth, I've been working in movies for over 65 years because the process teaches me so much. First, about the kind of good work people can do together, about the wonderful things that we're all capable of, of in our best, our shining moments, and about the dangers we have to avoid. As you can see, my life story has been lucky and exciting as a good movie, and that is the thrill of the movies. Movies can reflect every person's dream and fears in an infinite variety, are ways that we all understand. I think good movies, entertaining movies with good stories, all contain a single basic message that human dignity is always worth preserving. So much has changed in the making of movies, and yet so much remains the same. If we do our work right, audiences are moved as well as entertained. They leave the theater feeling glad to be alive, glad to be human, glad to reach out to one another. That's the kind of reaction we have when we go to good movies the sort of movies being made by my younger colleagues, directors such as Jim Cameron, John Sayles, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Oliver Stone, amongst others. Their work gives us all hope for the future of our profession. Now, just because this is a Lifetime Achievement Award, I don't mean to take a lifetime delivering this speech. <laughs> so I'll, I'll think I'll wrap it up now. On behalf of that young man from Indiana, I like to say, Klaatu Barada Nikto, which, <laughs> Roughly translated tonight means thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you.